What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Daniel Hallen and I am back with another true crime video and this one's going to be a wild ride so buckle on in. Today we're going to be speaking about the abduction of a 22 year old woman after she was held hostage for a number of weeks in a home in Excelsior, Missouri and this just happened back in October so a couple of months ago. Now the person that is responsible is currently sitting in jail awaiting their preliminary hearing which is actually this month on the 24th. Now it was set for December I believe first or second, but it was postponed. So hopefully it won't be postponed again. And that's why I wanted to get this video out now so that people could keep their eye on this. A lot of information in this case has not been released. So I feel like there's going to be a lot more that comes out. But while this case is absolutely wild and devastating and mind blowing because you just don't feel like things like this could possibly happen, there's potentially so much more to this case. And that's another reason why I wanted to cover it today. There is speculation in the area area of Missouri, Excelsior, Kansas City area, that there may potentially be a serial killer that is targeting black women. And the speculation was brought to light a couple of weeks prior to when this young woman fled from her captor's home. Authorities, ever since this information first came out, have been assuring the community that these are unsubstantiated claims. Um, as of right now, there's no proof that there is in fact a serial killer in the area just wandering the streets of Missouri, but the community still is is not absolutely convinced of that. And there is a large group of people that believe that police are just totally dismissing this when they should be looking into it. Before I get into the details of the case, I first want to say a huge thank you to Capital One Shopping for sponsoring today's video. While we have all heard of another browser extension that rhymes with funny, Capital One Shopping gives you the best chance at saving the most money while you are shopping online. Capital One Shopping can be added to your browser for free. It only takes a few seconds. And while you're shopping away, it's helping to search for better prices across tens of thousands of stores like Amazon, Target, Walmart, Apple, and a whole lot more. Any available coupons that are found are instantly applied to your cart at checkout, and you can earn Capital One shopping rewards while you're shopping as well, and then redeem those shopping rewards for gift cards. So it's just the gift that keeps on giving. I'm pretty far away from most stores where I live, so I do majority of my shopping online. I was recently shopping on Ulta trying to find some new curly girl products for my hair and Capital One Shopping popped up alerting me that I could save $3.50 on my order with an additional 3.5% back and a gift card of my choosing and that was a deal that I could not pass up. And since we are entering gardening season, I am starting a kitchen garden just outside of my front porch and I've been browsing around for planters and I was specifically checking out the Jumble Raised Bed Planter on Amazon and Capital One Shopping alerted me that I could save $32.90 if I purchased it new on eBay instead. So that is a lot of savings and a huge plus for me. Capital One Shopping is a simple and free way to save money while you're shopping online. And just last year, they saved their users $470 million. To start saving, go to CapitalOneShopping.com slash Danielle H or click the link that is down in the description box below and add Capital One Shopping to your favorite browser. That's CapitalOneShopping.com slash Danielle H. Another huge thank you to Capital One Shopping for sponsoring today's video. Working with brands like them allow me to do my job to the best of my abilities and donate to families and victims and organizations that I believe in as frequently as I possibly can. Now on to the details of today's video. So this all really started on September 25th, 2022. That is when these claims came to light that there was a potential serial killer. The Kansas City Defender posted a video that has now been removed from all social media, essentially, of a local community leader named Bishop Tony Caldwell. Now, Bishop Caldwell works with um, a nonprofit, the Justice and Dignity Center. He's been over a handful of churches um, out in the Midwest, out to Far West, and he is really intertwined into the local community in Kansas City, Missouri. And he has street level knowledge, obviously, because of that, when it comes to the ongoings in the area. And this is how he kind of came about the information that he claimed in the video. He works with a lot of the local youth, um, those that are struggling with drugs. He helps to get people up on their feet. He's just a very boots on the ground kind of person. And um, he and a lot of the other community leaders ended up being faced with this really scary possibility back in September of 2022. So in the video, Bishop Caldwell rang the alarms about this potential serial killer and said that there were a lot of young black women that were going missing specifically from the Prospect Avenue area 
in Kansas City. And according to information that he had gathered from the community, people that he was working to help, there had been four murders allegedly in the area over the past few weeks of September. And there were also three current missing persons cases. And all of these were somehow flying under the radar. It seems that these missing persons cases were never either reported to authorities or authorities claim that these individuals simply ran away or, you know, didn't want to be found. So no missing persons report was actually filed. And I'm not exactly sure what the details were around these four alleged murders in the area, um, but he did specifically speak about one set of remains that had been found and how he was working with this family um, because they felt there was something pretty serious going on in the area as well. This particular area of Prospect Avenue in Kansas City is known to be heavily populated by sex workers. Uh, so essentially this would be the ideal situation for a serial killer. If you look into different patterns, um, different victim profiles. It's very common for marginalized groups of people to be targeted. Um, people that could potentially go unnoticed. People that would likely not have families that would search for them if they went missing. People that are drifters. And sex workers in general tend to be victimized at a higher rate. And a lot of the times they fit perfectly into all of those categories. Fortunately, when you add on to the fact that they're sex workers, that they're also um, from the black community, the chances that there is going to be an active investigation into their disappearance are very, very slim. Now, while I've not personally watched this video where all of these claims have been made since it was taken down, um, Br Bishop Caldwell allegedly went on to describe this potential attacker based on information that he had gathered from those that are in the community and are dealing with the situation that it was a white male, um, kind of scruffy features. And this was essentially a plea to the authorities to to do something about what was going on. And this information ended up going viral. In the matter of, I believe, under 48 hours, there were 70,000 retweets. There were 105,000 views on the TikTok video. And people started to, you know, stitch together with this information. People were creating their own content around this and trying to spread the word that there was this concern in the community. Um, they were scared. And a lot of people were worried that this was just being ignored by the police. They wanted answers. And on September 27th, just two days later, answers seemingly came, but these answers did not calm anyone's nerves. The Kansas City Police Department made a statement in regards to this claim, calling them, quote, completely unfounded rumors. So they entirely shut down these fears and these claims and all of these questions that the community and a large group of people had. Authorities stated that they constantly updated publicly on if there were missing persons cases in the area, that all of those got pushed to the media for obvious reasons. Same thing with homicides and that if anything like that were going on and people were going missing by the masses in those areas, that everyone would know about it. They said that there had only been one homicide in this area in the past six weeks and it was totally unrelated, which I have looked into it. It does not seem related whatsoever. And I believe there were two teenagers in the area, two young black teenagers that went missing, um, but they were labeled as runaways. And I do believe both of them did come home safe. And so they're like, you know what? There's no proof of this. We don't have missing persons reports. We don't have this, that, and the other. So it can't possibly be happening. The amount of things that go unreported is astronomical. So of course, if authorities are looking into what has been reported and not digging below the surface and going deeper, that is absolutely what they're going to think. And so all of these worries were completely tossed to the side and everyone was urged to move on, to not be fearful, but it did start a lot of different discussions. There were some families in the area that did have, you know, missing family members, missing young women in the area. And they commented that these baseless rumors were very harmful to their missing loved one's case and their well-being. The fear that there could be a serial killer out in this area obviously had a lot of sleuths diving headfirst into the situation. So, I mean, even on Reddit, there is an entire compiled list of names of potential victims of the serial killer. And while speculation and, you know, doing your own research is one thing, and if you do have concerns, absolutely send it on to law enforcement or someone that can actively work on it. However, unfortunately, a lot of these sleuths were just directly bombarding a lot of families in the area saying, hey, I think your loved one was killed by a serial killer. And so it was causing a ton of stress, a ton of panic 
panic in the area. And this was just kind of making the situation that much worse. Most families that are dealing with a missing loved one already know the very scary realities that are out there. Uh, but when you kind of leave room for the community to take it upon themselves to do something, because it seems authorities are not acting, it can lead to chaos very, very quickly. And that seems to be exactly what happened. So it seemed like this was just one big rumor that caused way more harm than it did good. But just as the chaos was starting to die down, as police refused to dive into this possibility, something happened that seemed to make what was viewed as just a rumor a lot more believable. In the early morning hours of October the 7th, 2022, I believe it was around 7.45 a.m., Lisa Johnson, who lived off of Don Shelton Boulevard in Excelsior, Missouri, was busy getting ready for her day and all of a sudden she heard something on her front porch and so she went to approach the door to check out what was going on out there and was absolutely shocked at what she found. A young black woman was essentially crawling up her steps in serious distress. This young woman was dressed in spandex lingerie, Parts of her attire consisted of a trash bag. She had a metal dog collar wrapped tightly around her neck and it was padlocked to her. Her neck itself was also wrapped very tightly in duct tape. And the only thing that this young woman could manage to get out were the words, help me. Now, Lisa Johnson immediately panicked at what she's seeing and she said, quote, she was clearly dehydrated and very malnourished, super skinny. She was maybe no more than 70 pounds. Now, this young woman proceeds to tell her the most terrifying story. She stated that she had been taken and held hostage in a nearby home, literally one of Lisa Johnson's neighbors, and she had been there for weeks and just managed to escape. And so Lisa Johnson was like, stay put, I need to call authorities. But the young woman responded right away and even more distressed. She was very scared saying, quote, if you call the cops, he's going to kill us both. But Lisa Johnson knew that calling the cops was the best option in the situation. So she continued to go inside to call 911. And as she did, the young woman seemed so scared by this idea that she actually bolted off of Lisa's front porch and headed to another neighbor's house. This neighbor was Sierra Tharp. And I don't know if Sierra was home at the time, but I do know that her her grandmother, Rose Crowley, was at the house this particular morning. She apparently never was at the house this earlier on this particular day um, babysitting, but she just so happened to be. And thankfully she was because she was up and about. It was early in the morning. And as she is also going about her day, she too hears something strange coming from her front porch. So she goes to the front porch and immediately notices the same young woman in obvious distress going on and on about how she needed help help how someone was going to kill her and that she had just escaped from being held captive for weeks. Rose so Crowley was babysitting that morning. She's not normally at her granddaughter's home at that time of day. Around 745 in the morning on October 7th of last year, she says she heard a woman's voice say, please help me. I've been raped. So I opened the door for her and she came in and she says, I've been, I have been held hostage. Since September, she was shaking. So, I mean, from her toes to her top of her head, she was shaking so bad. She was so afraid he was going to show up. Never doubted her story for one minute. Police quickly arrived at Rose's granddaughter, Sierra Tharp's home. Put a blanket around her. And then uh, later I went in and got her some uh, muffins that come, those little bitty muffins that come in a bag. I gave her a couple of those and some water. Rose believes she was meant to answer the door that day. I helped her. I did the best I know how. And like I say, I think the good Lord put me there. The police, if it was okay. Uh, is it okay if I sit down beside her and give her a hug, uh, and hug her? And he said, yes. So I just sat there and held her. Rose says the woman told her she celebrated her birthday while being held against her will. We went and bought her a, a blanket, a uh, throw blanket and a little pillow and I bought her a birthday card to give to her and we took it to the police station. Now, when the police and EMS arrived, the first thing that they did was they had to break that dog collar and that padlock off of her neck. It was on there so tightly that she was struggling to breathe. That's half the reason that she couldn't get many words out when she was trying to speak to these people that were trying to help her. And so once she had it off and there was a bit of relief, she was able to more in detail describe the horrors of what she had gone through. 
This young woman told authorities that she had been taken by a man named Timothy in early September. So it had been about a month at this point. And she was taken from, drum roll please, Prospect Avenue in Kansas City. This man took her from Prospect Avenue and brought her to his home in Excelsior. And after they arrived there, he took her down to his basement. She said that the basement had a room in it that he had clearly built himself. It was especially made to hold someone hostage. He proceeded to restrain her in handcuffs on her wrists and her ankles and held her against her will inside of this dungeon room. Now, according to the affidavit that has since come out, quote, police noticed she showed obvious signs of having been restrained and there were wounds on her back. She said she had been whipped and raped while she was held captive. She said there were other victims, end quote. So everything that she was saying, they were able to corroborate just from looking at her beaten body, which is absolutely devastating. The fact that she was saying there were other people as well was a really, really scary possibility. Harp said, quote, she actually said the guy killed more than just two. She said it was her friends, but she wasn't clear if something happened to them up there at the house or wherever he got her from or elsewhere. And so she knew that two of her friends didn't make it. We don't know if they were potentially taken at the same time that she was from Prospect Avenue, um, if they had ever been down in the dungeon with her, but she seemed pretty adamant that there were more people involved. And this is really scary considering the fact that just weeks prior to this, Bishop Caldwell said that there were three young women that had been taken from the area of Prospect Avenue in those past few weeks, which lines up exactly with the timeline that this young woman is giving and also with the amount of people that she claims were taken along with her. This young woman continued to state that she was able to escape that early morning of October the 7th when she was left with an opportunity. Her captor had left early that morning to go and take his young son to school. She was somehow able to break herself free and she ran for her life. And this young woman told authorities that not only could she name her captor, her captor's name was Timothy, but she also could point out the home that she had been held in. So as the ambulance was taking her to the hospital to be treated, she was driven around the neighborhood and she pointed out the home at 301 Old Orchard Avenue. After this, this young woman was taken to the hospital where she was treated, questioned more, and hopefully left in the hands that those will help her in her journey to recovering and healing. For privacy reasons, obviously this is something that is incredibly traumatic to someone. Her name has not been released, thankfully, um, and there is no more information on her. And I genuinely hope that she is able to heal from whatever happened to her and that she is given every resource possible to ensure that that happens. Now, meanwhile, authorities are like, okay, we've got a name, we have an address, um, we've got all of this information from all of these witnesses so far and this victim. So they began to dig into who lived at the home and what their plan of attack was. And sure enough, things are still matching up. The home belonged to 39-year-old Timothy Hazlitt Jr. And according to records, he lived in this home with his young son. Now, Timothy Hazlitt Jr. was originally from Marion County, Illinois. He did live in Kansas City for a bit, so he had ties to that area. He also lived in Independence. And in 2013, he married and had a young son. Fast forward two years to 2015, he filed for divorce and ended up with majority of custody of his son. His history was unremarkable. He seemed to have a pretty average life. He moved into the home on Old Orchard with his son in 2017, and he worked as a railroad maintenance employee for a subcontractor that is based out of Kansas City. Timothy Hazlitt Jr. had absolutely no violent criminal history, but he did have over 21 moving violations, and there was also a failure to appear in regards to one of those charges. So nothing really seemed super out of the ordinary, but clearly something was going on if he was holding women hostage in his basement. And his young son this entire time was living above all of this while it was happening. Neighbors were also interviewed and they said that Hazlitt typically kept to himself. Some people rarely saw him come outside at all. He would maybe come out to let his dog out and back in and that's pretty much it. While others said that he spent most of his time outside working on cars, he didn't seem to go out of his way to be incredibly friendly with neighbors or um, go have conversations with them or socialize. I'd say a lot Which of sketchy stuff. I mean, very to himself. 
um, got a little boy, but he has a drone that he would use a lot. But um, no, I actually just spoke to him one time um, over the summer. I just went over there and introduced myself. His little boy was jumping on the trampoline and I said, hey, I've lived here three years, you know, how you doing? And just very like, what? You know, kind of move on out. He wasn't about it. Right. Just kind of um, very to himself. Well, he works on his truck a lot and ha usually has a car or a vehicle out there. He works in his driveway a lot. But yeah, the garage, I don't know what's up, but it would only usually come off the ground about that much. So he just kind of roll in like that and shut it and then roll back out. So that was odd. I've never seen anybody over there. And you said that your mom lives here. You don't live here, but your mom lives right here? Yes. Okay. Um, so tell me, first of all, just what you know about the people who live in this house or what you've seen. I mean, I come over here uh, a couple, two, three times a week um, just to hang out with mom, obviously. And every time I've come out here, um, I shouldn't say every time, but often he's outside, you know, playing with his dog. He's got a little drone that he flies around outside. And I, he always seemed like he was a little weird, but never never anything to that extent um yeah and so you mentioned you've delivered pizzas to that house multiple times yeah so i, I used to work at, at pizza here in town yeah and and i i've delivered to his house several times and i i always thought it was weird when he asked us to come inside to give the tip but i, I mean several people do that but for some reason it was just weird with this guy and clearly we missed something that should saw. Did you go inside? Just yeah, just in the, yeah. into the living room, not very yeah. far in, just just right inside the doorway yeah. usually. Can you say weird? Is it just a bad vibe? Or did yes, you exactly. Um, just quiet. Um, you know, not someone that would invite you into their living room and then not talk. People usually invite you into their living room, they want to talk to you or something, you know, you would be silent after I walk in there. Mm -hmm. It's just, he's a weird guy. Yeah. Um, so I know we're still waiting for confirmation from police, but we at least know they're investigating a kidnapping and sexual assault. Um, so what's your reaction to what we do know so far? It's, it's insane. I, I can't imagine that that, I can't believe that that happened in this neighborhood. <laughs> Nothing like that's ever happened around here as far as I'm aware. And it just blows my mind. What can't, is, sorry. I just can't imagine how, how it could happen. Yeah. Knowing that you've been there and you've been in that house, I mean, how does that make you feel or, or what's your yeah, reaction? I, since I've heard about this all this morning, I was sitting at work earlier thinking about it, like I wish I would have caught something, you know, saw, saw something that was off, uh, weird. I don't know how long it's been going on for, but I've delivered pizzas to him for a few years. And including that there had seemed to be some sort of change in Timothy over the past couple of years. It was also found that back in 2021, there were two separate welfare checks that were called on him. So it seems again that in that past a little over a year, over 2021 and 2022, there was just something strange happening. Now, one of the individuals that called was his father who lives out of state, and we don't know the reasoning behind that call. And there was also a friend slash coworker of his that called for a welfare check after Timothy didn't show up to work, like no call, no show, which I guess was out of the ordinary for him. These calls were made on December 23rd, 2021, and again on December 31st, which could be important dates. But unfortunately, we have no idea what happened during these welfare checks, if authorities were able to get face to face with him and make sure he was okay. Um, we don't know what his excuse was for why these had to be called to begin with. Um, but it's definitely something that I wanted to note because it's a little bit interesting to me. Now, the only other apparent incident in his entire history really was back in July, I believe July 5th of 2022, a neighbor called animal control on him after his dog lunged at someone. But other than that, no one ever saw or heard anything strange at all coming from his house. No one had any strange run-ins with him. Nothing appeared to really be out of sorts. So authorities decided to set themselves up right outside of Timothy Hazlitt's home, waiting for him to come back from taking his son to school. And it was about an hour after that original 911 call came in, so we're almost at 9 a.m. when Timothy pulled into his driveway and a gray Dodge Ram truck. Immediately, authorities were able to apprehend him and one of the neighbors managed to capture this on video. Now, I've seen that they were able to arrest him due to an unrelated animal control violation. He was brought in to be held for questioning and immediately a warrant was obtained to search his home. They needed to see if there was potentially a 
anyone else in there. And they also obviously needed to find some sort of physical evidence to really figure out what his charges were going to be. Now, when authorities went into the home, just as this young woman had described, authorities found a self-built secluded room in the basement. It was painted entirely black and authorities described it as a quote, dungeon like cell. There were multiple quote devices in the home that were obviously used to restrain individuals and harm them. Uh, there were numerous guns found within the home. So essentially everything up to this point has been corroborated. This man has a torture dungeon in his basement and he had been keeping this young woman there, but they didn't find anyone else on the property. There were no other people stuck down in the basement being held hostage. There were no obvious signs of remains from anyone. And so the investigation continued. Now we don't know at this point what Timothy has said to authorities, what he's claiming happened or didn't happen, um, if he even has an explanation at all. Considering the heavy coverage on this case and the prior speculations that there's a potential serial killer in the area, authorities are also understandably holding a lot of information back to protect the integrity of the investigation, not just for this young woman that was held hostage and managed to escape, but also if there are other victims that there need to be charges um, for or later on in the future. But regardless of what he did say or didn't say, authorities at this point felt they had enough to press charges. So Timothy was officially charged later that day with a first degree kidnapping, rape, and second degree assault. And they stated that Hazlitt is believed to, quote, pose a danger to a crime victim, the community, or another person. So I don't know if they base that off of what he said or just what happened, but clearly they felt this man was a serious threat. This young woman had expressed that she felt he would come and find her, he would kill her and anyone who was around her. So it's very possible he had expressed these threats to her, um, hoping to keep her there so she wouldn't try to escape. So good, there are charges, absolutely. However, they also decided to hold him on only a $500,000 thousand dollar bond. And given what this man allegedly did to this woman, um, that's absolutely wild to me, <laughs> like absolutely wild to me, especially when they spoke about how much of a threat he is to this victim and other people. I just feel like that should have been a lot higher personally. There's already so much fear in this community, believing there is a serial killer walking around that no one is doing anything about. And this also doesn't seem like a one-off crime. This wasn't just like you randomly decided to attack someone and that was that. You guys, this was a daily conscious decision that went on for weeks to torture someone and keep them locked up. I just, I don't know if I agree with some of the decisions made in regards to this man. So obviously a lot of people were infuriated with that. If you go and look on any of the news coverage on this, everyone's like, why on earth was he even given the option of bond? Now, granted, I will say he has made it very clear since then that he does not have the money to make that bond and he's not going anywhere. Meanwhile, authorities continued their investigation, and I don't know if it was simply because of what this young woman said or if they were putting two and two together saying, hey, you know what? We were kind of warned about this and now things are adding up a little way too much. Um, so over the next three days, there were extensive searches done at the home of Timothy Hazlitt Jr. And not just his house, his entire property. It seems they left absolutely no stone unturned. Warrants showed that they were looking for all sorts of evidence. They were looking for blood, bodily fluid, DNA, hair, fibers, you name it. They were also looking for um, digital evidence of any kind. And interestingly, there was also a safe listed on the warrant that seemed of particular interest. Everything else just seemed almost like a shot in the dark, um, just gathering any evidence possible to corroborate the idea that there could be other victims. Um, but it was interesting to me that they very specifically listed this safe. And during the search, the media captured everything that was going on. There were helicopters, news crews outside. The entire street had to be blocked off temporarily because of the amount of people that were rushing to this area to see what was going on, which gave the community a little bit more insight as to what exactly 
authorities were searching for, what was going on at the home, because they were remaining very tight-lipped about the situation. Cadaver dogs were seen at the house. They were clearly searching the inside of the home as well as the entirety of the yard. There were investigators that were going through countless trash bags outside of the home. Um, there were dozens and dozens of evidence bags piled into the back of investigators' cars. And it was announced at this time that the Clay County Sheriff's Department and Kansas City Police Department and the FBI at this point were all involved in the case. So it seems that they were taking these possibilities seriously. On October the 9th, Police Chief Gregory Dull stated publicly, quote, numerous items have been recovered from the residents and the process of examining and evaluating those items will begin this week to determine if any other crimes may have been committed. The following day of October the 10th, public work crews were seen arriving to the residents um, and all of the windows were boarded up. They put up a temporary fence around the entire home. I um, and on October 11th, Timothy was face to face with a judge for the first time. And he ended up entering a plea of not guilty. And he asked for a public defender saying that he just did not have the money to hire his own attorney. And I have a feeling that he probably ran his mouth a lot to investigators because he did the exact same thing while in front of the judge. He was speaking so openly with the judge that the judge actually had to remind him that out of an overabundance of caution, obviously, that he had the right to remain silent. He had to be like, excuse me, could you stop talking for a minute? You have a right to remain silent. Like you are aware that we are putting down everything that you are saying to me right now. And this can be used against you um, because he was just going and going and going and going, which from a psychological standpoint is very, very interesting. The way that individuals communicate with authorities and, you know, all these situations is why I end up just hours on end watching interrogation videos because communication can give away a lot. And so it's very interesting to me that he is just more than happy to talk about what is going on. And it's also interesting because it doesn't just stop there. He was so freely speaking to the judge, but he also wrote an eight page letter to a judge towards the end of November. Now his ex-wife for very obvious reasons has filed for sole custody of their son and is trying to take away any visitation rights from Timothy should he um, uh, managed to post bond, you know, the whole nine yards. And he ended up writing this eight page paper to the judge arguing against this, where he essentially says that his wife just wants money. That's the only reason she's doing any of this. He claims in this letter that these charges against him are allegations and nothing more than that. And they essentially never will be. And that the national news is reporting a one-sided story. He's like, I'm already in jail. I am not going to get out of here. I don't pose any threat to my wife or my son. He brings up the fact that he has no violent criminal history and says that alone should show I'm not a threat to anyone. And I'm just over here like, how on earth are you justifying this in your head? I'm really curious. And the national news is reporting a one-sided narrative. And so honestly, I personally would absolutely love to hear how he can explain a self-built dungeon in his basement of his home that he holds people in. Please have at it by all means. If you are going to claim that this is a one-sided story when there's this much evidence stacked up against you, I would absolutely love to hear an explanation for it. I really, really would. And so to me, he kind of comes off as just very arrogant and overly confident. And again, that is a quality that you see in certain individuals that makes this that much more frightening. By late November, he was also evicted from his home, obviously. And as I stated in the beginning of the video, December 2nd, he was supposed to have his preliminary hearing, but he asked for a continuance. I don't know what the basis of that was. I was not able to find it, um, but that leads us to his upcoming court date on February 24th. And when I tell you I am just sitting here on the edge of my seat, waiting to hear what happens, Given all this information, again, there are still so many questions and you can see why all of this information began to go viral again because authorities had just quelled these rumors. They had just blown everything off. And under two weeks later, we have a young black woman taken from Prospect Avenue by a man matching the description of the one that Bishop Caldwell gave and it's claiming that there are more victims that add up perfectly to even the number given in that video. So either this is an absolutely incredible coincidence or there is absolutely something going on. 
Now, Kansas City police, because of this, were asked if they changed their stance based on this new information. Everyone's like, there's no way you can deny this anymore. At the very least, entertain this idea and do some investigations to make everyone feel safer if there really is not anything going on. And so, again, they were asked if they changed their stance and they didn't. This is exactly their response. Quote, we base our investigations on police incident reports of criminal activity. We do still maintain that there is no indication that what you guys reported was accurate and there was no indication that there was anything that supported that claim. We share what information we can publicly many times from the scene of incidents of violent crimes when there is a report or an investigation underway. There has not been anything that corresponded to your reports on social media and the web, which is why we refuted that report and said that the claims were unfounded. So they're still saying there's absolutely no evidence at all to support this claim, which is wild to me considering, you know, there was an abducted woman fitting the exact circumstances that had been stated in that claim. Unfortunately, it seems like authorities are just being very dismissive. Instead of saying, we're looking into it, um, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on, we're seeing if there's any correlation, they're outright saying, nope, there's no, there's no correlation here, there's nothing going on, and everyone can just move on again. Obvious reasons, people are very upset about this. There was no missing persons report for this young woman that escaped, at least that's the way that they're making it seem. She is saying that she was taken from Prospect Avenue. So if they are looking into missing persons cases in this area and had been stating at the end of September, which is weeks after she was taken, that there were no missing persons report, clearly this is like the epitome of the reality of what's going on. So if they are able to look at the situation where they have a young woman that has clearly been abducted and held hostage and she was never reported as missing, and in the same breath, they are okay turning around and saying, well, there's no people reported missing in the area, so nothing's going on. It just absolutely boggles my mind, like to no end. Community leaders are responding to this saying, you know, why would you expect anyone to trust you, come to you with this information when you are being entirely dismissive of a situation that's going on. And unfortunately, there were families that also came forward that said that they had tried to report their loved ones as missing and authorities essentially turned the cheek. I so, wondered, you know, what is your, what is your communication been with police uh, since then? None. Zero. Zilch. They are backtracking as much as they can now. Uh, I have a few friends at the police department that are reaching out, <laughs> telling me, good job, don't give up, you need to keep, you need to... I have a couple of friends that told me to make the comparison in certain areas and to look at certain things. Uh, prospect being the key point. The young lady was snatched off of Prospect. We were talking about people that were snatched off of Prospect. At the same time point that this young lady was taken off of Prospect was the same time point we were looking for those young ladies and she being one of them on Prospect that was taken from that area. So that was the easiest comparison uh, that they told me to just keep following up on. No matter what anybody says, follow up in that area. They can't dispute that, no matter what. Uh, they tried to, so far, saying that there was never no missing women. Uh, there was all a hoax. No one died. No one's missing. No one's being taken off a prospect. But again, that's the same thing that happened with uh, Terry Blair. The exact same thing that happened with Terry Blair. And we ended up working that case uh, by accident. We was doing a neighborhood cleanup and ran across the first body. Uh, doing a neighborhood cleanup. Uh, and it just kept going, kept going, kept going as we were doing more cleanups within the community. I found out there was more young ladies there and more missing. Uh, but again, they kept saying these are isolated incidents as this is going on. But we knew even in Blair's case that it's not isolated. Uh, uh, Berdella mm -hmm. here in Kansas City. Sure. <laughs> yeah. How he got away with it too. Right. 
uh, they kept saying isolated incidents. Here's a man selling body parts in the store right. in Westport. Yes. Uh, but it just in front of you, even. But you're pointing it out, and they're telling you no. Yeah. It becomes a troublesome thing, you know, when you. I guess you know when you when you when you're the black sheep of the town because you do have a big mouth and you won't shut up because things need to be brought to light. Things need to be exposed. Things need, those hard conversations need to happen. I'm fearful for my grandkids. That's why I do what I do. It's for my grandkids, for the next generation coming up. Because if I'm gonna live here in Kansas City, there's gonna come a day that I can't walk, I'm old and I'm tired, and I need somebody to look out for me. And if I don't give them the tools too, then I'm really hurt myself. We have the tendency in the community, law enforcement, the community, looking at a difference between, and I'm not saying this by a long shot, but we look at young ladies that work the streets at night, getting in the cars. They usually say, well, that's on them. They knew what they were getting into. But these are some young ladies that have been taken, literally, that do not work that industry that are just out partying and having a good time and are snatched off the streets by these individuals. It doesn't matter if they are working in that industry or not. This is not something that they agreed upon. This is not something that somebody wants. They still need to be treated with dignity and respect. They are human. They have rights. No is no. It doesn't matter. No one ever agrees to be locked in a basement, a metal dog collar, and I'm picturing this in my mind because I think about the slave collars. Around this young lady's neck with a padlock that no one's looking for because they're saying it's not happening. If she would have never got away, we wouldn't be here today. They would have just they said, No, it doesn't exist. She doesn't exist. Knowing that. She was snatched, taken off of Prospect, taken to Excelsior Springs. How many more? How many more? She made the statement her friends did not make it. That lets you know that there was more than her. But they're going to overlook that. Because right now they, they can't have that type of publicity in our city with football season tourism the World Cup is not good for the homeless they're sweeping the homeless out if you notice drive around Kansas City yeah. where they used to be the camps are gone they just sent the city in and just took all their possessions, took everything, bulldozed down the camps, and they're gone. Winter's coming. Where are these people going to go? How are they going to survive? That's kind of how I feel like they treated this, these young ladies, these young men. It's more than young ladies being snatched. I want you to understand that. We have some young men that are missing. But that's a whole different story. They're not going to talk about that at all. We have to do better. We have to do better. So honestly, the entire situation just feels like a big double-edged sword. Because when you look at it just as a whole, without a missing persons report, 
police really don't know to search for an individual. How are they going to know to search for someone that's missing if they don't know this person is missing? Um, without a set of remains, police cannot investigate for a potential homicide. According to what police have said, these original claims that were made by Bishop Caldwell were never actually brought to them. No one came to them and said, hey, we are worried that there is a serial killer out there. And so they're claiming they learned of this through the video. And it just seems like this lack of communication is harming everybody involved. If authorities need people to come forward with missing persons reports. They need to take those missing persons reports seriously. And there is a very clear pattern of them not doing that. 25 year old Simone Jackson went missing in early 2021 and her grandmother actually went to the Kansas City Police Department to try to have an investigation done to try to report her as a missing person. Now, first of all, she is over the age of 18. So it already creates a bit of a challenge in getting anyone to take it seriously. Um, but there was initially an investigation opened and authorities went and spoke to her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend at the time that she had lived with when she disappeared. And he claimed that, oh, well, you know, she broke up with me. And then she specifically said that she didn't want to speak to her family ever again. And she was going to disappear. As if that's not like the most suspicious thing in the entire world. And I guess authorities were like, oh yeah, sounds reasonable. And then wouldn't file her as a missing person. And I've tried to look her up. She's still not filed as a missing person, but she is still nowhere to be found. And so this is a part of the history of this police department. And that is just one example. If you Google it, you will be able to find just a whole entire list of articles of families that are like, we are trying to get this police department to investigate our missing loved one. They won't even file them as a missing person. Just a whole can of worms is opened when you look into it. And and there was actually, um, during all of this, it was announced that there was a federal investigation opened up against Kansas City Police Department after allegations of racism and harassment within the police force. So there is some issues that are going on and it's not at all surprising that the community does not trust them. And it's also not surprising that they are not really looking into this, which is very, very scary because this is like the prime opportunity, as I've already stated, for a serial killer to thrive. The fact that they could look at some Simone's grandmother and directly tell her they have absolutely no obligation to search for her granddaughter is an absolute gut punch. And that should never be the response you get from law enforcement when you go to them to ask for help. And so I know that a lot of this may seem like it's coming off harsh. A lot of people get very angry when I talk negatively or call out a police department for their actions. But I mean, this is not just a one-off thing. This is a history with this police department. It is a known thing. You can trace it all online. Um, there's a federal investigation open against them. So I don't think it's completely out of line to call them on the fact that they're being very dismissive about a situation that could potentially go on to lead to multiple deaths. We can't say for a fact that there is a serial killer in the area. I really hope that those in this area are being incredibly mindful, that people are looking out for each other. I'm genuinely hoping at this point because I do not believe local law enforcement will specifically bring in any sort of outside entity to look into this possibility that it is stumbled upon while investigating this current case involving Timothy Hazlitt Jr. The FBI is already involved in it. There's other um, agencies involved. I'm going to be keeping tabs on this case as close as possible to see what happens. I think the most beneficial thing at this point is to just spread this information so that A, people in the area can protect themselves further and be aware of what's potentially going on. And B, authorities in that area know that people are watching and they are waiting for some sort of definitive answer and investigation to be done. Because so far they are denying something that appears to have potentially been proven true immediately after the claim was made. So I would love to get your opinion on this. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and go you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to this story. If you're in this area, again, remain vigilant. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Helen fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.